The Collaborative Research Center works on a number of pathogens of global importance that are a major cause of disease and death worldwide. Some of our work that we do in this Collaborative Research Grant centers on malaria research and on human immunodeficiency virus. And we have a team of 25 research groups from all sorts of different fields, from biology and medicine, but also from chemistry and physics, material and nanoscience, and from scientific computing to work on these pathogens in a joint effort. But we also integrate across scales. We work at a highest temporal and spatial resolution, but we also work with multicellular um, systems, which ideally would mimic the natural infection in an individual, in an organ, in a person, in an animal. And of course, then link this to trying to develop new strategies to overcome these infections, treatment for all sorts of efforts. So that's the overall situation, bring together complexity into a near native situation. Within the network, we work together with theoretical physicists on trying to understand how malaria parasite migrate. So parasites are injected by the mosquito into the skin, they migrate 10 times faster than the neutrophils, the cells of our immune system that catch them. And we really want to understand how this works and how it can be blocked. What we often do is we take mosquitoes that are infected with malaria parasites, we take out the parasites and then we investigate them with different types of microscopy techniques. And the data that we take out, the quantitative data goes to the physicists and they try to model what happens and then feed us back hypotheses that we can then test experimentally. So one method we use in my group, and it, which is very helpful to work with experimentalists, is so-called multi-scale modeling. So we can actually come up with models which bridge all the scale from molecules to large-scale movement of the parasite. We also came up with new ways to measure the stiffness of the malaria parasite and to relate all of these properties, force generation and stiffness, to the way it moves in tissue. And we can now explain how the malaria parasite manages to move so quickly through the tissue and how to find the blood vessels which are essential for the cause of the infection. One thing that is fascinating about how these parasites move is that they do it by lots of independent motor units. And we built a model to capture how if you have a curved shape, this effect vanishes and you can more easily get productive motion, which is why we believe that this might be an influence that drove all of these parasites because many also of the relatives to the malaria parasite have curved shapes to evolve this shape uh, to more easily move productively. So our key goal is actually really to understand how HIV causes disease. Until now, HIV research has really been conducted on individual cell types in a tissue culture that does not reflect anything that happens in an infected patient. Now, the key innovation we really have within this SFB is that we try to create tissue mimetics from the bottom up. We take 3D collagen matrices, embed cells, and this allows us over time to study how the virus replicates and how the immune system reacts to that. We were able to identify a novel type of restriction activity of type 1 collagen matrices that are able to sensitize viral particles for innate immune recognition in cells such as macrophages, which then leads to the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are inflammatory molecules that can drive an antiviral state. We had uh, input from uh, mathematicians that performed some mathematical modeling for us, and also uh, cryo-EM imaging that was also possible thanks to the help of SFB members. So with this new finding that the tissue changes immune recognition of HIV, we're now diving into the molecular details. And of course, we want to use this knowledge to apply it therapeutically later. So in our HIV project, we try to understand how the virus enters and traffics in a newly infected cell. It has this peculiar shaped cone-shaped capsule that everybody has seen in, in pictures. And in this capsule is a genetic information which needs to reach the nucleus and integrate into the DNA of the host. Now this capsid has been shown in our recent studies to passage through the channel that connects the nucleus with the cytoplasm, although it seems to be too big for it. So it's a completely surprising and non-expected mechanism to enter the nucleus and to shield the viral genome from antiviral defense mechanisms. 
So first, the capsid gets sucked into the central channel of the pore by binding to many disordered FG proteins of the pore. Then, through the clashes of the FG nucs with the capsid, the pore cracks open at some point and the capsid can progress further. Finally, it binds to CPSF6 in the nucleus and then gets released from the nuclear pore. The modeling through MD simulations allowed us to look at the process of capsid passage dynamically. The disordered FG nuc proteins that play a critical role during capsid nuclear entry can never be visualized with cryo ET, but could be modeled in our simulations. We are participating in most of the projects that are run in this building. This includes malaria research, HIV research, uh, as well as research on many other human pathogens. In the HIV project, you use super resolution microscopy and the correlative light and electron microscopy to look at the passage of the core through the, uh, over the nuclear pore. And in uh, malaria project, uh, we simply imaged uh, the malaria behavior in, on the different biophysical uh, and biochemical situations. So when we look at things like nuclear pore complexes, usually we take one nuclear pore complex at a time. But when we use expansion microscopy and also STET, we can look at many of these structures overall. And this has, for example, enabled us to see that in human macrophages, actually nuclear pore complexes cluster which is really interesting because it might indicate there is a specialized function of these clusters in the cell. Techniques like expansion microscopy instead can help us identify more of these special events and gives us a resolution that we were not able to access with any light microscopy technique before. So this really will push the envelope on what is possible in live cell research. So achieving a better understanding at a new complexity, at a higher complexity and in more natural systems will create new questions. But Heidelberg has established this community which will tackle the research in the future. And there may be new pathogens, there may be new questions, but we are well prepared for it.